hear me? Yes, hi, boss. Uh, I can hear you now. I actually was on mute, so I just unmuted myself. Wow. How are you doing? Dr. Siddiqui has decided to deprive us of the pleasure of seeing him this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell them the details then. <laughs> well, I can, I can try to turn on my video. If I look okay, I'll keep it on. Otherwise, I'll just turn it off. That's okay. Go ahead. It's over to you. Oh, you're looking, you're looking. Okay, that's fine. As, lo as long as I'm okay, I'm presentable, that's okay. Uh, I was also, uh, just, Today, we also have to tell, let the people know we're not related. <laughs> we look alike, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they might be thinking we're related. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just, just a very short, uh, you know, uh, a little behind the scene before, <laughs> before I came online here. I was in bed. And my lecture was maybe a little later, and uh, I just got a, a, a ping on my phone. I just picked up my phone. It was a boss. He was asking me to come on earlier, so I, <laughs> I'm I'm very raw right now. So I'm really sorry. I pretty look sh pretty shabby right now. I just fixed my hair. I just tried to take a shower. He said you don't you don't have don't have time for shower. Just <laughs> just come down right now. So uh, a boss is a very good friend of mine. Also at the same time, so you know uh, I can do anything for him. So he's uh, I'm glad he's he's uh, he's had me here. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, do you want to share your screen? Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, yeah. Can you guys see my screen? Um, yep. Dima thinks you look great, so don't worry. Okay. Or well, you have a woman telling you you look great, no, then it means you look, you look fine. Really? I, I, I mean, I'm going to read that later. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to distract me right now. <laughs> <laughs> you get distracted so easily, Shreem. <laughs> I'm not just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. I'm just, just calm, trying to start. Calm lady. down, guys. I, I'm old enough to be your mom. It's okay. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so mom says you look great. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> no worries, hon. <laughs> okay, I'll let you talk. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Abbas, uh, let me know whenever you're ready for me to go. We're ready. Actually, one of our uh, speakers had connectivity issues, so we made a few changes uh, to the program. And uh, but but now we're kind of back on track. Uh, we'll be having two more speakers after you, Shoaib, and uh, the, one of them is already in the room. So and the next will be joining shortly. So that's uh, I think we got the rest of the day sorted out. So we'll go yeah. shorter day than yesterday, uh, as we all already knew. And uh, we slipped in a few. Yesterday was more strategy and. Um, concepts in terms of management and approaching um, the practice. And today we've slipped in a few clinical topics and clinical subjects like um, sleep apnea, endodontics, clear aligners uh, for the interest of the audience. And uh, uh, I would say without further ado, uh, Shoaib, do your All right. All right. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, by the way, by the way, so, sorry, I, I have to uh, I have to give you a short uh, background to the audience about okay. Dr. Shweb. They will be unfair if I don't do that. Dr. Shweb is a graduate of the year 2000, which means he's two years senior to me. Uh, he graduated from Bakai Dental College in Karachi, and uh, he followed it up with an MDSC <clears throat> in restorative dentistry from England. And uh, spent some time as an assistant professor at the Bakai Dental College and practicing part time, and uh, then some time at the Qasim University, Qasim University in Saudi Arabia, and uh, then he moved to US, and he did his MSD in endodontics, published a few articles, and now he's a full time endodontist in the state of Washington, USA. So he loves to share. He loves to share his knowledge and skill with uh, colleagues and that's something that uh, I, I really admire about him and that's what uh, made him the uh, the first person that I thought of when I want to put together this program because this is someone who is keen to share what he uh, knows how he practices uh, wealth of knowledge and uh, you know what better combination can you get when you have a person who's knowledgeable and is willing and keen to share it with his colleagues. So I think this is a great opportunity for everyone to learn that the uh, first step in endodontics, which is diagnosis. Sorry, Siddiqui. All right, Mike, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I, I, I chose the topic of diagnosis because, uh, you know, in my experience of teaching and, uh, you know, I have a very long history of teaching and, and now the interclinical practice where I work alongside with a lot of general dentists. 
um i i you know i realized that there's a there's a big issue with diagnosing cases i get a lot of referrals uh, you know because they have issues with diagnosis or if the dentist i work for have already diagnosed the case and send the case to me for treatment and then I, when I jump back in, and I always start with the, with my own diagnosis, uh, with my own clinical tests and everything, I I come to the conclusion that uh, you know that uh, not most of the time, but sometimes I do realize that the tooth that was sent to me was not the right one, and uh, so I'm just going to keep it very uh, you know this is a very vast topic. I could talk for this the whole day. There's a lot of stuff to cover, but uh, uh, you know keeping in mind uh, keeping in mind the 45 minutes that I have to speak and, and taking questions also maybe. Uh, I'll just keep it very short and, uh, you know, in the future, if there is something that comes up again, I would love to come back and talk to you guys more and uh, maybe do something more in more detail. Um, so let's just carry on right now. Uh, Abbas has already given you my introduction. Uh, um, you know, I do not work without the scope anymore. Uh, uh, you know, I was started off my career, of course, like every dentist does. Uh, you guys who are practicing the West are more blessed than from where I come from because we don't use loops over there today. Uh, so, uh, you know, over here, you guys are exposed to your loops uh, right when you're in, in your dental school. So I think that's a blessing, you know, make the best use of it. Um, but now I've limited myself just to the scopes. I don't even wear my loops. Uh, my bosses don't like that about me, uh, but I just uh, leave myself to uh, limit myself to the microscope. So I do more of micro and adonis now, uh, only because I use the microscope more. Uh, so, so the purpose is, I, uh, you know, that's something I really want to familiarize you all with is, using the right terminologies in, in, diagno in diagnosis and endodontics, because I've seen a lot of people, I'm in a lot of forums on pages on Facebook and social media, I see a lot of people, you know, giving their diagnosis. Uh, and I, it just troubles me because I just see they're not using the right terminologies or they're not using the right uh, phrases. So, uh, you know, we just want to go through the terminology with you guys, uh, you know, discuss the different types of clinical tests, uh, you know, how to systematic, systematically approach uh, diagnosis, and then I will just like to show you like maybe two or three cases, just so that you uh, guys can get familiarized with uh, you know some 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 challenging cases I came through, uh, which I recorded and I thought I'll share it with you guys. Uh, so we'll just end it up because uh, you know endodontics is, is a very clinical field. Um, uh, it does not do justice if, you, if I just show you written and text slides. Uh, you know it's it's more fun to show you cases also. So we'll do that right in the end, okay? Uh, but like I said, I'm just going to keep it very basic. And, uh, and then we can, in the future, maybe do something more, more in details. So, uh, you know, let's to start with, you know, diagnosis is uh, every, every word uh, the patient uh, tells you, every question that you ask is like a little jigsaw puzzle, a piece of that puzzle. And uh, our job is to get, gather all that information, right? So that every small puzzle that you see on the screen right now is, uh, is uh, an information. So our job is to, is to make sure that we can that that information is out there we need to gather it and keep it together and then make a, a and you know fix it together put it in one place and then make something out of it okay so then the last piece that we put in gives you then the whole that picture and then brings you up with your diagnosis now uh it also depends on how you place that information okay so you have to gather some stuff you've placed it you can see the picture on the left right now it, it looks a little you know off uh, this is some kind of a scenery. Uh, I, I broke it down to four pieces and I missed it here and there. Just to show you that, you know, although you have been able to put on a few slots here and there, but if it's not assembled properly, uh, that does not give you the right diagnosis. So if you end up putting every piece together in the right place, in the right position, you get a better picture. It's, it's more beautiful. It's more pleasing. Uh, so this is what I, I, this is how I see diagnosis. Uh, every small little puzzle in there is, a diag is, is an information that you need to gather. And then, then you should be able to put them together in a way that it gives you a clean, good picture. Um, this was the best uh, way to come up with this. So, uh, you know, I won't go into too much details because these are this is there in every textbook, uh, in every article that you can read. It's on, you know, Google. Just search, search it down. You get these little forms. Uh, this is from uh, <clears throat> this form is from the the pathways of the pulp, uh, and you can see how systematically, uh, you know, they, they ask you these questions. And this is something you need to keep in mind. You know, there's a level, uh, a scale level. I always ask the patient uh, the level of intensity for the pain. When they come to me, I ask them, you know, from from one to ten, what is your level of pain? Uh, ten being the most severe. I noted down my notes, and when I bring them back for follow up after treatment, then I ask them again, and they'll, uh, you know, and I can tell them, you know, when you came to me, you were nine. Today you're saying it's about three or two or even zero. 
so that shows that you know we have, we have progressed in a way. So so these are all ways to uh, gather information also. Uh, and then of course, like I said, you link them up. So, you know, uh, these are regular questions you all uh, know about, uh, but we tend to skip them sometimes and we miss important information. So you know, just go through these uh, uh, little uh, questions that that's mentioned here. I can send these uh, to uh, Dr. Boss, and then he can forward these uh, little slides to you later also um, to help you, you know, get, get a print out. You know, I would I would suggest you guys, if you guys are on your computers or whatever phones, just take a screenshot right now. Everything that you see, you know, just, just copy it and you know, take the print out and keep it in your practices or in your besides your desk, wherever, and just 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 go through them. You know, a habit becomes uh, your uh, your nature. Uh, or, or something becomes your habit if you keep repeating. So just just keep seeing these things, and it becomes it it becomes a part of you, and you never miss these things. Okay, medical history is very important. Uh, uh, you know, we we just were like, do you have any medical conditions? Uh, you know, this is a very common question we ask. Uh, but you need to know the drug histories, and then the reason why you want to know the drug history is because there's a lot of drugs that we use, uh, and we don't want them to interact. Uh, uh, and uh, or, or nullify the effect that they use, especially like patients who use like uh, blood pressure medications, for example. You don't want to give them uh, something like ibuprofen, for example, uh, um, because that might uh, not uh, make the drug ineffective for them uh, and uh, raise their blood pressure, and that could be uh, of severe consequences. So you know you need to have these little informations and you know try to relate them, like I said, and come up to a conclusion. Okay. Um, so a clinical exam, uh, we always stop the external. So every time the patient comes in, uh, uh, I glare at them. <laughs> and I, you know, I try to look at the facial symmetry. I see, you know, can I see something from outside? Does, it, does, it, does one side look more buffed up? Does, you know, so, so you see these things. Uh, I, you know, you can always find little, uh, little uh, scar uh, tissues uh, on the, on the, maybe on the outside the surface of the mouth. Uh, they can tell you that this drains, maybe you can palpate for lymph nodes. Uh, does, does the patient have fever? Uh, you know, these days, uh, of course, we check, we check all our patients with fever because uh, uh, because of the COVID situation. But of course, fever will tell you a systematic involvement or uh, of of the infection if there is something of, of a dental infection. Uh, and this one thing that I want you guys to understand is the anatomical distribution of an infection. So, if a patient is coming up with a swelling, can you make out looking at the swelling where or which tooth may be involved? You know, and that 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 helps a lot. Uh, and when you tell the patient, oh, you know, when I my patient comes in with a swelling, I can tell them, oh, I, I think you've got a problem with one of your front tooth, maybe your canine, for example. And they go like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even tell you. How do you know? So, you know, so these are, these things will uh, impress the patient. They will give confidence to the patient that, you know, this this guy knows something and, uh, and makes them feel more comfortable to open up in front of you and talk to you more. Uh, so this is, again, a little, little chart that I'm showing you here. Any tooth that is... Uh, that has the apex above the muscle attachment, it's always going to go in a, in a, in a space where you'll have a more diffuse swelling. And if it's attached, uh, uh, if, the, if the apex is, is above the uh, attachment, it's going to be more of a localized swelling. Um, and that's why you will see it more puffed up on the face outside because it's into the tissue spaces because the apex is probably higher uh, um, or away or more, more attached uh, from the muscle there. So, um, localized swellings are more, more, uh, you know, towards, uh, you can say more towards the vestibule or towards the sulcus. That's where the apex is then. Uh, so these help, again, like I said, you know, when you see a patient, you know why this is coming up. Probably the root is like that, the muscle attached in such a way. And then you can tell the patient why this is happening because they want to know why, why do I have a swelling? I've had many infected uh, infections come out. Why do I have a swelling right now with this one? So you can, you can, you can explain them this thing. Uh, of course, then Next thing you want to do is, you know, you go into orally, you go and look at all, all these soft tissue changes, look for ulcers. Uh, you know, just because I'm an endodontist does not mean that I, I miss on things that uh, I could, uh, you know, ring bells. I can tell the patient, you know what, I see this ulcer. What about this ulcer? How long has this been? Oh, dog, this has been going on for a while. It doesn't heal. You know, slightly goes down and comes back. And I send them to an oral pathologist, for example. I, you know, send them somewhere to an oral surgeon. And I, and I you know, have, have them biopsy the face and just see what's going on. I... I had a cousin over my phone. Uh, he was discussing his uh, tongue lesion with me. He's pretty young, uh, very much younger than me. He's in his like maybe in early 30s now. Uh, that time I was in his mid 20s. He had a lesion on his tongue. I was just talking to him. I told him to take pictures, send it to me, and you know I told him go to my friend in Pakistan, and you know, he went there. It, it was biopsy. It turned out to be some kind of a carcinoma at his age. 
but luckily it was caught so early that uh, he's uh, doing pretty good now. So, so these are things that you want to keep your eyes open for. Okay, you want to look for localized diffuse swelling. Like I said, why that happens? You want to see if it's firm, fluctuant. If it's fluctuant, then most probably you can burst it and you know let the absolute drain out. Yeah, you know, make the patient feel uh, more relieved. Uh, if there's a sinus crack, always uh, try to trace it because that can help you with diagnosis. Now, if you have a tooth or if you have a segment of the jaw which has multiple fillings or root fillings also, uh, root canals done, for example, from premolar to molars, all have been done. And now the patient is in pain and you don't know which tooth to, uh, to diagnose now. And there's a sinus crack, just place your GP and it will take you right to the tooth there. So, so these are tests that you want to do. Okay, you want to palpate, see if there's any bone uh, erosion, if there's any swelling over there that you cannot see uh, visually. Uh, you want to percuss the tooth because percussion, uh, you know, 80%, 80%, 90% of the times uh, will, uh, will lead you to the right tooth, okay? Uh, you want to see mobility. You want to see uh, the, the periodontal uh, involvement around that region. Uh, is it something that you want to save? Is it something you want to extract and do something else about it? Uh, so these are all questions that need to be answered before you uh, uh, head towards the diagnosis and then make a treatment plan. Uh, the next step would come to your limiting yourself to that tooth. Now, which one is the one that I need to go and treat? Uh, so you have your the, the all-time favorite, the thermal test that we have, uh, uh, and then you have the EPT. So this doesn't come on the thermal test, but this is your electric pulse test. Uh, so you have the cold, the heat, and the EPT. You have the you have you know you'll hear these terminologies like the LDF, the laser Doppler flowmetry. You'll see pulse oximetry now being more discussed, but these are more limited to your researchers more lab-based because they are, you know, uh, right now they're very big machines and uh, they're not very practical uh, in, the, in the practice and, and pretty expensive also. So now we have to limit ourselves to these three, cold, heat, and EPD, okay? Uh, now, one thing before we go into the, all those tests is, you know, I need, I need you guys to understand that when we're doing these thermal tests or, uh, or we're doing the EPD, we're looking at sensibility. We're looking at the presence of nerves. Now we always talk about vitality, you know, the, the pulp is vital, uh, you know, I think the pulp is vital. I did this test, the patient is going to call the pulp is vital. Well, uh, uh, it's, we don't call that vitality because vitality is assessing the blood flow of, of a tooth, okay? Uh, vitality is, uh, uh, is more, more related to your blood flow. Sensibility is more related to your nerves. So whatever response you get from the patient is nerve related. So that means there's nerve in there. Uh, but now again, like I'm saying, you are not able to see the tooth is vital because you cannot assess if there's blood flow in there. So uh, what we do is we try to make this own hypothesis that, you know, okay, if the nerve is alive because I'm getting response from the nerve, that means uh, uh, there should be blood because blood supplies nutrition to the nerves and that's why the nerve is still alive. So that's how we try to link this and, uh, and, and come to a conclusion that maybe the nerve is alive uh, or the pulp is still alive or vital, or vital right now. However, uh, you know, there was a study that showed that uh, when, this, when there's a necrotic process going on, uh, blood vessels go off first and the nerve vessels still uh, are intact for a while. So, uh, so that cannot, does not always mean that when you get a nerve uh, response or sensibility response from the tooth does not mean that the tooth is vital. Uh, so we need to keep this in mind. And of course, then we have to drift ourselves to other tests to understand what's going on there. Uh, your, your history, your, your, pres your uh, complaint the patient is come, come walks in with is very important right now. Uh, to assess if the tooth is alive or not. Uh, like as we talked about these, uh, you know, the, the two indicators, the blood flow, and these are all the other ways to find uh, if the tooth is, uh, has the blood flow or not. But like I said, these are tests that are not available in the practices right now, and they're more based uh, on in researches right now, so limited over there. But if, if, if you had to do these tests, they, they would be very useful for trauma cases because when you have trauma, the patient uh, hits the tooth, for example, on something, uh, falls and then the tooth is in shock. So the nerves don't respond. And now the only way to see if the tooth is alive or not is to do uh, something of this sort, uh, which shows blood flow in the tooth. So you know that the, 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 there's blood flow, the nerve is in shock, so you know the tooth is still alive. Uh, one thing I want to uh, you know, be more uh, a little stressed over here is on the cold test. Uh, if you look at the specificity is, 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 uh, is a test which tells you uh, or, or uh, marks uh, how healthy the pulp is, okay? This sensitivity is when there's a, a, a test that can detect disease, okay? Now, if you look at the specificity of cold is 93, of heat is 41, okay? So that's pretty low. 
for sensitivity where you can detect disease, the cold is 83 and uh, heat is 86. That's pretty close, okay? Now, if you look at EPT, there's the electric bulb test, uh, the specificity is 93%. Um, so uh, this, because the value of cold is always higher than the rest, uh, we tend to, and the donors tend to like to do cold more. Uh, now, you know, when I was in residency, I like to do cold and EPT together. I, I've uh, hardly ever done heat. I don't do heat at, at all now. Um, I only rely on cold. Uh, whenever I get a chance where I'm really confused, I'll pick up my EPT and check for that too. Uh, but cold is something because of this the study done by Peterson uh, is something that why we want to do more cold. Now, cold has different ways of doing it. You know, you have the ice stick technique. You have this refrigerant spray that everybody has in their practices. Uh, you know, you can use Q-tips. Uh, you know, just, just damp it with a spray on, on, the, on the tip on one end and then apply it on the tooth. Uh, however, uh, with ice, uh, you know, I, I think ice is very good. Uh, I, I'm not sure why it's dying out now. Uh, wherever I, I have issues with the cold spray, I, I tend to move to the ice stick. That gives me a better reading then. Uh, but uh, because ice is done, uh, uh, used uh, this ice stick, uh, sorry, the refrigerant spray is used more commonly. This is why I just want to specify a little bit more on this because this this is where I feel that people are uh, are making a few mistakes and not getting the right tooth. Okay, uh, I don't like to use Q-tips uh, only because they are very densely packed, and so when you spray on them, they don't get wet that quickly or wet that easily, and uh, they just uh, get wet on the surface. So by the time you take your uh, Q-tip to the tooth, it uh, has lost most of its cold, and uh, so that does not give you a very good reading then. Uh, what I prefer and what studies also show is the number two cotton pellet. That's about like 5.5 millimeter in diameter. Uh, you can always make that with your uh, um, with your um, cotton uh, rolls also. Just pull something out and just make a little ball out of it and just use it. Uh, this is where, uh, you know, if it's too small, again, it does, it, it, it goes away very quickly. If you use too big, then again, it does not get very wet. And uh, so number two is pretty, pretty okay. So that stays on for a while. And this has shown more uh, better results uh, when you use it. So whenever you're using a cold spray, uh, try to keep in mind, use something that's uh, not very dense, uh, like the Q-tips, and use something that's not too, uh, don't use something that too, that's too small. Use something like a number two uh, cotton pellet. Um, and that really helps. That, that changes diagnosis very much. APT uh, is better used to assess if the tooth is necrotic uh, and more useful in cases of obliteration, of course, because uh, where you have calcified canals, it's not easy to, uh, because your nerves, if, if you look at this number, uh, Abbas, I'm sure you guys use uh, 2 1 here, right? This is 2 1 for you guys. The, the nomenclature? Yeah, the nomenclature. This is, this is 2 1, right? All right. So, so, it's, so you can see how, how calcified the canal is. So now, if you put coal on this tooth, it's not going to respond because uh, you, the coal has to travel through the dental tubules to do that hydrodynamic theory that you guys, I'm sure, already know of. So there is no tubules anymore now, so, so that doesn't work. So then you, use, you go to your EPT, uh, and that helps to you know, transform some, some, transfer some electric current in there and get some response from the nerve. Of course, you don't want to leave it for too long on a tooth that's, for example, necrotic. You're just placing it for so long that now the electric current is going into the PDL, into the bone, and you get a response from there. And then you go like, oh, the, the tooth is still alive. Uh, well, actually, it's dead. Okay, so you have false positive and you have false negatives with your, with your EPT. Uh, false positive means that uh, you know it's, the tooth is dead, but you're getting a response. Like I said, if you leave it for too long, that will give you a positive response. Uh, if the tooth is partially necrosed, you know where there's a there's a, a caseous necrosis where you have a liquefactive necrosis, where you have some kind of liquid in the canal also a little bit, that transfers the current into the bone and you get response from there. Is the patient highly anxious? You know, the moment you touch the tooth with this device, the patient will go, oh, I feel it. And uh, that's where uh, you know uh, you were like, oh, maybe the tooth is alive. Um, of course, if you don't have good isolation, you may have saliva around that region and the saliva might pick up that current and go through the sulcus, gingival sulcus, again, give you some response. If there's contact with metal restorations, of course, uh, that will give you a bigger response also. Uh, false negative means that the tooth is uh, alive, but it gives you, uh, uh, makes you feel like the tooth is dead. And uh, that could be again, like in, in calcific cases, uh, recently traumatized cases, like I talked about, you know, the nerve is in shock. So of course the nerve will not give you a response. So you might go like, oh, maybe the tooth is dead, but that's actually because the nerve is in shock and that doesn't happen. That, that's where you can use laser Doppler, Doppler flowmetry or something like a pulse oximetry 
which can really give you a better uh, understanding of the of the um, uh, the white light, what the vitality of the the pulp there. Uh, immature apex again, the nerves is not well developed, so you have that, that problem. And then drugs that you know decrease the pain threshold and then poor contact, like I talked about, also uh, you, it has to be properly contacted there um, to give you. So so if you look at this over here, oh sorry, uh, if you look at this uh, this tooth over here, uh, you know uh, studies have shown that uh, let me just see if I can draw this very quickly here. So if this is the tooth, uh, the central incisor here. This is where they suggest the incisal edge is where you want to keep your EPT or your coal. Um, you know, if, if this is the lower tooth over here, that just suggests um, the, one of the buccal cusps over there that you can uh, place your um, your um, your applicant on and then uh, applicator on, and that gives you response. But uh, you know, this is good for theory. Uh, but um, you're all drawings. It's good for theory, but what I do is sometimes, you know, when I don't get a reading from these points, I, I will go a little bit more higher. Uh, I don't mind going into the mid, middle of the tooth. I sometimes I go very close to the uh, cervical region because any place that works is okay because you don't know, you know, there may be restoration there that you cannot see, or there's some, some kind of calcification. The nerve probably has gone back because of decay. So you don't feel that way. So I like to go a bit more cervically. So Theoretically, things are there, yes, but you know, practically, sometimes they may not be very applicable. So you need to be very open and uh, be ready to make a few changes here and there, as long as everything is under uh, control. Um, so you have special tests. You have the bite test. Uh, you know, we want to check if the patient tells you, you know, I have problems when I bite. That, that may be a sign of a crack tooth or, or maybe some kind of a crack somewhere. Uh, so you want to do your tooth flute. If you don't have a tooth flute, you can use a Q-tip. Uh, make the patient bite in the Q-tip cusp by cusp, uh, or you can even make the patient bite in cotton rolls, okay? Because again, they're densely packed. Uh, you can do transsubination for cracks. You can do staining. I do a lot of staining for cracks. I can show you some cases also. I'm going to show you a case with that. And this is the test cavity, which I think is very barbaric uh, because, you know, you don't give any anesthesia to the patient. You start drilling inside the tooth and see if the patient responds or not. Uh, I think that might be a, a caveman era kind of a test. Uh, and then you have selective anesthesia, which, which is not very commonly used, but there was a case where I used this and it helped me in diagnosing the tooth. And I'm going to show that case to be very interesting, very good anatomy also in there. Uh, so we'll talk about that in the end. And uh, for, we just talked about the tooth tooth and the Q-tips. Uh, so the key to successful clinical testing is good communication with the patient. So uh, I always tell everybody, you know, you need to tell the patient what you're doing before you do it. Uh, you just don't say, okay, I'm going to check if your tooth is alive or not, and you start applying coal or EPT, uh, you need to tell the patient. Uh, you need to brief what, what you're doing it, why you're doing it, so the patient understands. Uh, I always tell my, if my patient comes and tells me, you know, I feel uh, pain because of coal, then I tell them that, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to apply this coal here. I know that's going to be a little uh, painful, but we have to do this so that we understand what tooth is involved. And that, uh, you know, is a little uncomfortable for them, but they're ready for it. So even if it hurts them a little bit, at least the patient doesn't go like Dr. Siddiqui is not a good dentist. You know, um, they, they were prepared for it. Um, so you need to tell them why you're doing this. That's very important. And, uh, and how you're going to do it, what kind of response you expect them, uh, expect from them. Like I tell my patients, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to apply this cold on the tooth. Uh, and uh, I want you to raise the left hand uh, when you feel the cold. And even if it's very slight, because they're expecting to raise their hands when it hurts. Okay, so even if you don't clear this to them, they're going to keep the hand down and you're going to, the patient's feeling it, but it's not telling you. You will be under the impression that the patient is not, uh, the tooth is not vital. Uh, so you have to tell the patient, you know, even if it's very slight cold that you feel, just raise your left hand. When I take this uh, applicant, uh, applicator out, uh, put your hand down when you stop feeling the cold. Uh, and that, that tells you that, you know, for how long uh, the patient feels it and uh, if it lingers or not. So communication is key. Okay, it's very important. You have you tell these things to the patient. Uh, the graphic evaluation is, of course, I know the next step that you want to do. Uh, I try to avoid looking at the X-rays first because that starts giving me a bias. You know, if I look at if I look at something, I go like, maybe this is the tooth that's bothering the patient. I won't limit my my um, my my conclusions uh, 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 to to later. Uh, so you know, you have digital X-rays. Uh, I don't want to talk about too much details about that. You have CBCT is now currently more used. Uh, uh, MRIs are coming in in dentistry, uh, you know, where you can locally uh, look at a tooth without exposing the patient to radiation. That's something very exciting. I'm hoping that comes out soon. Uh, we may be able to see much more uh, detailed uh, images because of that. 
uh, but digital radiography is something that we have, everybody has right now. And that is something that we want to make the best use of. Uh, and I always, uh, you know, try to take like a few views. I don't just take one straight view and look at the image and make a decision. I always like to take one mesial and one digital also, uh, like slop technique, which, uh, which you know, it, it gives you more, more kind of a 3D view, if not 3D in actual. Uh, but studies have also shown that it improves your diagnostic accu accuracy up to 90%. Uh, so just looking at one view, one 2D view is not enough. You need to have three different views and try to make up a, an image in your mind, fix them together, and you get a better view like that, okay? Uh, so I always do one straight, one slightly easier, and one slightly distal. And that helps me to uh, understand uh, more, very useful for anatomy. It helps me to, you know, see missed canals, you know, if there's a curve in the root or not, uh, that it helps me there too. Now, these are the terminologies I want you guys to keep in mind, okay? Uh, diagnosis and endodontics is based on uh, two uh, 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 factors. That's one is the pulpal diagnosis, and the second is your endodontal diagnosis. Now, the pulpal diagnosis uh, has these terminologies that you can use, which is the normal, which is reversible, symptomatic irreversible, asymptomatic irreversible, pulpal necrosis, pre previously treated, and previously initiated uh, therapy. Now, you know, you may not agree with the few ter the terms here if you look, look into the definition. But right now, this is what we have. This is the most currently used by the uh, American Association of So uh, we are sticking to this right now, but I'm sure with time as we grow, uh, um, you know, we'll find better terminologies to use. But right now, this is what we use. This is what you should use. Uh, and this helps to communicate with the patient and to other doctors uh, um, uh, so they understand what's going on with the two. Um, this is, again, something I can share with you guys uh, later so that you guys can you know, even keep a copy. Uh, right now, you know, it's a good chance time to uh, uh, take a snapshot, uh, sorry, a snapshot, a uh, screenshot and save this with you, okay? Uh, now, so the reversible and irreversible is something we get confused with, okay? Uh, if the, uh, I'll tell you what normal is so that we can carry on from there. Now, necrotic pulp is usually very easy to diagnose. There's no response from the tooth. Uh, you know, if you see a, a big lesion in the uh, patient's uh, radiograph, you go like, oh, the tooth is already dead now. Uh, but reversible and irreversible, is something that we get confused with, and this is where uh, the treatment change. If it's reversible, then you don't need to do a root canal. You can just do a simple restoration or a crown change. Maybe that can help. So, and irreversible is something that you want, want to jump into uh, to to save the tooth and do a root canal. But then, do do we know what reversible, irreversible is? How they present, and that can get get confusing. Okay, and uh, this is something I will spend a, a two or three slides on so that we can understand this. Uh, and this is where it, it differentiates a better diagnostician the, from the one that's not too good, okay? Uh, so, uh, can we have somebody, this, this, there's somebody who has a mic, mic on, Mr. Patel, Ms. Patel. Thank you. All right, so, uh, so how do we determine if the pulse status is normal, reversible, or irreversible? Um, Normal is when you apply a little coal on the tooth, for example. So there's a gradual uh, sensation. There's no discomfort and it does not linger for long. Okay, so when you remove the stimulus, uh, it, it goes away immediately. Reversible is spontaneous. So you place it and the patient feels it pretty immediately and lingers on for a few seconds, but not more than five to 10 seconds maybe. And irreversible is you, you place it, the patient feels a sharp jump maybe exaggerated responses and it lingers on for a few seconds to a few minutes. Uh, that's irreversible, okay? Uh, to, to understand disease, you need to understand what's healthy first. So normal is gradual, no discomfort, no lingering, and anything after that is something that you want to start uh, looking into. Um, now, so, so does this apply clinically all the time? So this is, this is where people get confused. Um, you know, I've seen in my experience that you need to do a lot of, you know, you'll always hear this, uh, do uh, more teeth um, so that you understand what's going on there. Uh, that's only because, uh, you know, um, every patient has a different threshold for pain, okay? Uh, I may be a very uh, a sissy kind of a person, but even if you touch my tooth with your finger, I'll, go, I'll jump with pain. Uh, and there may be somebody you might hammer, uh, 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 you know, throw a hammer at them and they won't even say, ouch. So, you know, everybody has different levels of, of pain uh, thresholds. So what, what I recommend you do is that you test all teeth on, the, on that side, on the lower jaw and the upper jaw. For example, if the patient comes with the pain on the left side, just do all the teeth on the left side and uh, lower and the top ones. Uh, try to establish a baseline. Try to understand how this patient responds 
to this test of mine and um, then sir, compare sir, that with the two that we are pending to. Can I just yes, sir. For a second, there's a question. In case of crowns, which test is preferred? Uh, okay. In, in case the crowns, that's a very good question. Uh, in case you have a crown on the two, uh, the cold test is, is, is a good test to do. Uh, like I said, if you have a metal kind of a crown, your EPT might not work on that. Uh, I don't like to use heat only because I showed you that little, uh, little table there. Heat is not very reliable. Uh, so your cold test should be pretty okay with a lot of your crowns in there, okay? Um, be it your metal fused to uh, porcelain or should it be it uh, some kind of a ceramic uh, crown, all ceramic crowns, all porcelain crowns. It should be your cold test is the best test that, uh, that I do. Uh, and I would recommend that you guys stick to your cold test there. They're okay? All right. So, uh, uh, like I said, establish a baseline on for that patient and then compare it. Some patients might give you pain on every tooth, okay? And you'll be like, man, this every tooth over here is painful. Then which one is the offending one? Well, the offending one probably will not give you any response because it's a dead tooth, or it might give you a more sharper, more jumpy feeling. And you'll be like, wait a second, this tooth here was more responsive. That probably this is the one that's bothering the patient. Sometimes uh, I do a lot of teeth and there's no response from any teeth, but uh, one tooth gives a slight response to me with the patient. Uh, yeah, I felt that, I felt that a little bit. And for me, that is the offending tooth then because for, the, for, the, for that patient, uh, the baseline was that this does not respond too much to cold, but this one gave a slight response. So for me, that is probably uh, the one that I would you know, call the suspect, okay? So uh, establish the baseline. Yeah. Question from Isa, what do you mean by spontaneous irreversible? Spontaneous irreversible? Spontaneous in the context of reversible pulpitis. Okay, okay, yeah. It, spontaneous is like you, you'll have an immediate response or you have a immediate. more quicker okay. response. Oh. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I think immediate is the word that... Yeah, yeah, I don't know, here they use spontaneous. <laughs> Spontaneous problem, okay. you know, because certain people might interpret the term spontaneous as un untriggered or, you know, uh, it is. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. So you can say it was yeah, you can call it immediate. Yes. Yeah. You can call it immediate. Yeah. So you'll have a more quicker response. Uh, 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 so it's the patient, you know, if, if, if there's gradually normal, for example, the patient tells you uh, when you apply the cold on the tooth and the patient tells you after three seconds, uh, I felt that. Uh, reversible, the patient will give you a response maybe in two seconds or 1.5 seconds, which is more earlier, but does not linger. And irreversible, which is sharp and, uh, you know, is actual response, the patient will probably give you a more immediate response, uh, which is, uh, you know, which is more sharp and more painful and with lingers on for longer. Another um, question by Monica is whether the cold test is done with simple ice or endo ice? I, uh, be, I, like I said, uh, you know, I use more of endo ice right now, that's a refrigerant spray. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, you can, do, p p people used to use a lot of ice sticks and a lot of people do still keep it. Uh, my go-to is the ice when I see that I am not able to get too much good responses from the cold test, from the, from the spray, then I go to the ice sticks then. Um, but usually it should, your, your cold spray should be okay. Uh, if that's if something that you want to keep in your practices, if you ask me what should I do from tomorrow onwards, I would say just start using a cold spray right now with that number two cotton pellets. Uh, that should be pretty good to start with. Okay, uh, let's move on. So, uh, you know, just, I'm just adding a little, just a little more uh, like a little nerd kind of a slide here, where you know, does the clinical status of the pulp really reflect what's going on histologically inside? Uh, just because the patient is showing pain, does it mean that the nerve really or the pulp really is infected or inflamed? Uh, you know, so there there are different views on this. Uh, Sedzer and Bender said no. There's no correlation, uh, uh, but Rikuchi uh, more recently said that yeah, there is a correlation. So if you see that there's a normal pulp or a reversible pulp, most probably 96% of the times, that's really the case with the, with the pulp. And if there's uh, an irreversible uh, pulp, then 84% of the times you have the right diagnosis. That is because we're trying to diagnose a, a tooth histologically, but we're doing all clinical tests. Uh, the best way to see if the nerve uh, of the, or the pulp, sorry, is, is vital or not, is to, is to do a histological section. Now, the only way you can do a histological section is to remove the, extract the tooth, uh, you know, cut it in pieces and then, and then look, at, look, look at it under the microscope.
but by that time you lost the tooth and uh, never been able to place it back inside the patient's mouth. So, so we try to see if, you know, what I see clinically, is it really what's happening inside the patient's mouth? Rikuchi recently said that, yes, that's what's going on there. Um, so I think we're pretty much, pretty much accurate, if not completely. Uh, so the next one, the next component to the diagnosis is your periapical diagnosis. Now that's, of course, that's also there. I see a lot of people just talk about your, the pulpal diagnosis though the patient had irreversible pulpitis. Well, what about the periapical diagnosis? You know, that these all things link together. So of course you have a normal periapical tissues. You have symptomatic apical periodontitis where the patient comes with pain. Uh, there's asymptomatic apical periodontitis where the patient, uh, you may see a, a lesion on the, in the uh, radiograph, but the patient does not have any pain, but that's something going on there, of course, right? You have chronic apical abscess where that means that uh, there was abscess in there, but because there's a sinus tract, everything drains out from there. Uh, so that means abscess is being formed, but it drains out. So the patient will not have severe pain or may not have pain at all, okay? Acute apical abscess is where the patient will have severe pain, will have swelling. Maybe the tooth is slightly bit more, uh, you know, outside the, the socket. And then you have condensing osteitis where you might see that, that uh, you know, more radio opacity around the root apex there, which is a sign of a low grade, very slowly, uh, a slow stimulus, a very continuous stimulus for a very long time. Kind of an inflammation. Uh, you know, when you do the root canal in patients with the condensing osteitis, 50% of the times uh, the, it will heal, it will come back to the normal trabecular uh, bone pattern. But 50% of the times it will not, but does not mean that it has not healed. Uh, you will look at things like the patient's symptoms and, you know, the red, red lucency coming around it or not. That'll, so you need follow ups, of course, with these cases. Uh, one last point that I want to discuss is that, uh, and I tell this to all my doctors, uh, if you're having trouble, you know, you've gathered all, you've done all the tests, you've gathered all the information like we talked about, and you're still not able to come to a diagnosis. There's one simple thing that you can do is just refer the case out to your endodontist. Uh, you know, because we're trying to, you know, a lot of times uh, there have been a lot of cases where the wrong tooth has been diagnosed and uh, has been treated and, and, and the offending tooth is still in the mouth. So that's something that we want to avoid, especially in areas where we live now and where we work, uh, you know, uh, we are highly liable and uh, we can be sued. So you wanna make sure that you uh, do not do such things. Uh, there was somebody who was discussing something just yesterday um, on the, uh, on the uh, endodontic society's uh, pages yesterday, and I was just sitting and talking to everybody. Uh, there was a case where they sent a case, uh, a patient to, for extraction to the uh, surgeon, and instead of removing the first premolar, I think they removed the second premolar and now, and when they realized that that was the wrong tooth that was removed, they, they, they placed back immediately. And we were all discussing now what's going to happen with the tooth. Uh, uh, that's, you know, don't ask me questions right now on that uh, because that's a different topic. But, uh, you know, so things happen. Things happen, but we need, we need to make sure that we are on the right track. We have the right tooth in our hand so that we can treat it and get the patient out of pain and not add more troubles to the patient. Okay, the patient's already in stress. You don't want to give more stress by doing the wrong treatment. Okay, that's the last thing you want to do. So whatever happens, if you're doing a diagnosis, you're not having problems, uh, you're having problems, you're not coming to a diagnosis, refer the case. If you're trying to do a treatment, you're doing, trying to do a root canal treatment and you're not getting anywhere, uh, refer the case out to an endodontist before you mess it up so much that even the endodontist can probably not fix it. So, uh, you know, refer wherever you feel that it needs to be done. Just try to make sure that you understand it earlier on before you make more errors, okay? Uh, let's talk about those interesting cases that we can uh, quickly wrap this up uh, uh, and then take a few questions from you guys. So this upper left central incisor, okay, uh, uh, this 57 year old patient came in, uh, did not have any significant medical history. Complaint was I had this little gum on my tooth, over my tooth for a long time. Uh, he gave a history of trauma in 1980s, okay. Uh, this was a patient I saw in, nine, uh, in 2000, this was during my residency. So that's just a year back. Okay, so maybe one year, two years back, I saw this patient and uh, his anterior crowns had fractured and they made crowns and restored aesthetics and function. Clinically, sinus tract was evident. There was a little, little bump on the gum there, but you could not trace it, okay? Because it was sort of closed right now for, for that day. There was no mobility. There was a little five millimeter pocket on the label side, um, which, which, which probably was a sign of a little bone loss on that side. So that's the patient's clinical picture there. You can see it's a little, uh, little bump on the gum here. Uh, you know, so we, 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 we get, look, look at the x-ray here. You can see a little lateral canal here, maybe. Uh, you can see some sealer coming out here. So, uh, you know, my guess, if you note here, you don't see any radiolucency around uh, the root tip. 
Okay, the root tip, if you look at the lamina dura, it's all intact here. Otherwise, usually you'll see a big swelling here, okay? Uh, or, so, sorry, a swelling. Uh, you'll see a big radial lucency here. But because you don't see that, you see something happening over here, okay? This is your lateral canal here. So you go like, okay, I told the patient, you know what, we can try to do the root canal again. Uh, and, and then I'll try to get, get into this lateral canal here, try to clean everything out for you. And then we can, you know, just uh, 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 see how you do. Uh, the next option that I gave the patient was that we can also uh, just do a surgical procedure. And I see if I, if I can go inside from here, uh, from outside the tooth and try to do a little ultrasonic preparation and clean this out. And, you know, because there's no lesion here, so probably we can just fix it from here. Uh, so I gave this few options to the patient. We discussed it, you know, uh, and we saw, you can see there's a little, uh, little you know, uh, probing depth here. You can see a little bone loss, which was evident here uh, in, in this another angle here. Uh, I took a CBCT. You can see uh, a little uh, radio. You don't call radio lucency and CBCTs because that's a different kind of a, a, a genre in, in x-rays. But you can see this, this radio, uh, um, lucency is more easy for you to understand over here, which is a little dark spot there, okay? Um, so it looks like everything was going on around here. Uh, so we decided, you know, let's, let's uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I can go in there with a file to fix it. Um, uh, so we, we discussed some options. We told the patient, you know, let's do the redo, let's redo the endo and see how you do, or we can consider a surgical approach also if the retreatment does not work. Or, uh, you know, since we suspected that there was a crack over there, uh, because of the bone loss uh, on that side, uh, you know, we said, let's do an exploratory surgery where we can just raise the gum, see if we find any cracks there and then decide if you want to do the root canal or not, because if there's a crack there, then it, it does not make sense to do the root canal. Then the better option would be to extract and place an implant. So the patient said, you know, yeah, let's go ahead and see because, uh, you know, he, the, he did have an, uh, a history of trauma. So we said, okay, let's go ahead and, and explore. So what I did was we, uh, you know, we, I raised the gum. You can see this bone defect right over here. So labially uh, on the measles side, there was this bone loss here, as you can see here, um, I'm playing red on red, I'm, that's my fault. Uh, let's, let's do black here, okay? So you can see all this bone loss here. This is where you can, I was getting five millimeters of probing, okay? Uh, so the next thing I did, the next thing I did was, um, where did you, just, you can see, can you see this little bleak line here on the root? So that, that looked like a crack to me, okay? Uh, let me again draw this so that it's more visible. Uh, you can see this little line here. That seemed like a crack. You know, it could be some kind of a pedal attachment on the side, I wasn't very sure. So, uh, you know, I said, okay, let's go ahead. And we talked about um, uh, staining. That's what I did. I stained with methylene blue there and that crack became very evident, okay? So that's when I told the patient, you know what? It does not look like too that uh, that can be saved. And that's something you need to get extracted. So uh, right when the patient was there in my surgery chair, uh, you know, I just put the flap back. I didn't do anything. I told the patient that this is a better option for you, and uh, just let your gums heal a little bit, and then we can send you to the oral surgeons. And they can. So, so this was a little more, more kind of an exploratory kind of a uh, surgery, uh, and not a complete echoectomy kind of a thing. Uh, but that you can see how that helped to uh, to come to a conclusion. Uh, so sometimes you have to you know cross uh, little limits. Uh, to come to uh, a diagnosis there, okay? Uh, and that was uh, just a few days when the patient came back to me for uh, suture removal. You can see it's pretty much healed up already. And that's a good thing about doing micro surgeries because you do, uh, you know, micro scalpels and, you know, very, uh, you know, very um, uh, uh, good sutures and they really helped, okay? Uh, the suture was out in three days and you can see it's pretty much healing already. Uh, this is the case of selective anesthesia. A very confusing case. I was beating my head on the chair. I did not know what to do with this case. Uh, the patient had recently been referred from the faculty practice in the in the university where I was doing my residency. What happened here was the patient had a recent restoration in the in the upper right first premolar. Okay, right after that, the patient started experiencing a lot of sensitivity. Okay, um, uh, so I, I you know uh, the patient said you know I got this feeling done and right after that I feel extreme cold on this side now you know and uh, and he kept pointing at the premolar where the feeling was. Uh, I did the cold test, uh, the, uh, you know, and like I said, do the whole segment. Just don't do the uh, two that the patient is talking about. Uh, it's very easy to, you know, just to do the first premolar and go like, yeah, you know, I'm getting a cold response. Probably you, that is in trouble. But I did from the, the canine to the last molar on that side. Uh, so the upper first premolar was sensitive to cold. However, uh, when I did the second uh, upper, upper second molar, 
uh, the right, the last one had an exaggerated response to call. So, and there was no response to palpation uh, and percussion upper premolar was sensitive, but now the upper second molar was not responsive. So that means there was apical, something apical problem going on uh, with the first premolar, but nothing with the second premolar. So apically, uh, apical diagnosis for a second premolar, a second molar was normal for apical tissues. Uh, because I did not see any radiolucency, there was uh, the only thing that was catching my eyes was uh, uh, what that sharp response to cold. Okay, but if you look at the cold test for the upper first premolar, that was the complaint of the patient. They did have cold uh, sensitive to cold response and was sensitive to percussion also, which was leading me to say that yes, that is the tooth. But somehow, when you look at the X-ray, uh, now the extreme right one is is uh, uh, your first premolar. You can see that deep restoration, how close that is to the, your, your pulp chamber there. And if you look at the, the last molar, the second molar, the measly, it has a big restoration there, but it's pretty much close to the, uh, uh, with the, to the, to the pulp chamber there. So my, you know, I was not satisfied. Maybe the patient was having pain on percussion on the first premolar because, because of a high spot on the tooth, on the fill restoration, maybe that needs to be grinded out. But I kept thinking of this to the second, second molar here. Um, and I wasn't satisfied. Uh, I kept doing the tests, uh, all my tests. Uh, the patient kept pointing out to that first premolar there. I kept thinking of this also. I told him, you know what, we'll, we can do that first premolar, but I think you will need treatment on this one too. Uh, however, uh, you know, uh, I kept repeating the test. Like I said, uh, what I did was the, uh, uh, after asking all these questions I talked about, okay, the patient was lying on the chair and you know, I was just still thinking what to do. Uh, the patient started feeling severe pain. I thought this was the right time now, uh, you know, because, you know, one question that you always ask patients, do you feel pain when you lie down? And the patient says, yes, then that means there's some kind of irreversible something going on there because the blood pressure towards the head increases when you lie down. So there's more, you know, that throbbing feeling in the tooth then, and the patient responds to pain that side. So when, while he was lying on my chair, I had the patient flat on the chair. So he, he said, no, I'm feeling severe pain right now. And he started, he had tears, uh, tears trickling down. So I said, this is a good time. So I picked up the anesthesia. I num numbed the first premolar and the patient after a few, uh, after a minute maybe said, I feel better. I go, okay, you know what? I was looking at the second molar, uh, but I numbed the patient on the first premolar right now. The patient feels fine. That means this is the tooth. Now I started gathering all my instruments and my files and everything getting ready for the first premolar. The patient said, I'm experiencing severe pain again. I said, why is that happening? So this time I numbed the second molar and the patient immediately felt better. I waited for some time. The patient did not feel still. And that was, that was how I did selective anesthesia to help me come to that conclusion that that second molar was the actual problem, not the first one. Now, this clinical picture that I'm showing right now here is of the access that I've made. Uh, this is uh, the second uh, molar. This is the mesial root with three mesial canals. So that's MB1, MB2, and MB3, okay? Uh, that was a very fantastic kind of uh, anatomy there for me. So I was not just happy that I got the right tooth, but I was happy I got a good anatomy also. Uh, and so I, you know, I opened up the canals, I removed all the uh, the pulp there, and then I put some, you can see this white, white uh, uh, calcium hydroxide inside the canal. I sent the patient. The reason why I not finish the case on the same day was because I wanted to make sure that I got the right tooth. So I removed all the pulp and I put calcium hydroxide. aside. I sent the patient back. When the patient came back to me, he said he feels absolutely fine. There's no problems with the tooth anymore. And he was very thankful, very grateful. Uh, so while I was treating the tooth uh, in the second visit to finish it, you know, there was a lot of bleeding from the, uh, from the palatal canal. So I went back in with a bent file to look for lateral canals. And I, you know, found one that was a bleeder. It was very inflamed in there. So right after I put the file in, there was no more bleeding. Um, so that was my obturation right after my case, you can see. Uh, pretty long roots for a guy, uh, and you can see that lateral canal was filled. A slight extrusion of the sealer, which uh, you know goes away with time. Uh, if you look at the other angle, you can see how uh, how many canals are filled in the mesial one, and you can see this little extra extension of the canal right here, this one here. So these three canals, they join. This one canal here, two and three, they all join into one, and they split into two. So one goes here and the other one goes here. So this was a very good anatomy. And of course, your, your, your protocols for your cleaning is, is very important here. Again, that is a separate topic. Uh, but you can see how it, it, it helped me out here, okay? 
and that's that's all after my observation over there uh, so the lesson over here the site of pain is not always the same as the source of pain so you need to understand this thing this is a very important uh, to, uh, thing i'm saying here is the site of pain is not always the same as the source of pain so this was this case was of a referred uh, pain okay uh, so you need to understand this uh, and 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 make sure that you test all the teeth on that side one last case i'm going to show you very quickly this is a role of cbct uh, this patient came to me with the with the upper left second molar and he was done uh, root canals were done by an endodontist if you look at the x ray here this is the first molar over here uh, again let me use that little marker here very quickly you can see this is the first uh, first molar here this is the second here and uh, with this first you can see that he had an mb2 here that was nicely filled up to the full level and then uh, you can see over here that uh, the mb uh, there was an mb canal here palatal and a distal here in the second patient kept pointing at this one he said i just got this done last year but it keeps hurting me uh, you know, if you look at the X-ray, there was nothing much very evident there. I didn't see anything there. We said, okay, let's go ahead and do uh, do a, um, a CBCT. Now, if you look at this, oops, what's there? Uh, hold a second here. Clear all drawings. There you go. So with this, you can see on the CBCT, it showed a nice big involvement of the bone on that side with the uh, associated with the measles root there. Now, if I look at the at the at a different angle of uh, on that one, you can see. That this here is your second molar okay this is your mb root you can see that you have one canal filled here but there's a missed dot here that's the missed canal there okay so you can see that that's the mb2 that was missed on that one and because it's not very common to find mb2s in these molars so probably that uh, that endodontist had missed it but uh, it was right there okay so uh, and even when i went further more epically you can see that root was the only root that was involved in the in, with the lesion just to buckle and palatal were not involved. So uh, I did a selective kind of a retreatment where I made a small hole, just measly, and knowing the anatomy, I went inside the MB1, I removed all the gutta percha, I troughed a little bit, I looked for MB2, I found it, and then uh, we went ahead and we, you know, this, this is my working length slightly out of the bone there, uh, and then we fill it up. So you can see now the, the tooth has the MB2 filled, and uh, although the patient did not come for follow-up checkups, uh, the patient, uh, I did, I was in touch with the uh, patient on the phone for two years of my residency, and the patient was absolutely fine, did not have any problems with the tooth anymore. So, uh, so you know, so this is saying here that we see what we look for, and we look for what we know. So your knowledge is really dependent on everything you do. So you know, expand your knowledge, and that will help you see more, okay? That's very important. And uh, in the end, thank you all very much for being so patient with me. Uh, you know, I speak a little fast. I don't know why. I get excited when I talk. And, uh, but yeah, feel free to ask any questions if you have, and uh, I'll be happy to help. Um, in other words, the eye does not see what the mind does not know. Exactly, yeah. I just started to be a little different today. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shoyer. That's, that's the alarm for my lecture with you. <laughs> that, that was supposed to be a little too early. Yes, sir. At this time, but um, amazing. So Monica um, has two questions. Is there any clue which cases can land up in an endo flare, flare up, and shouldn't CBCT be done for every case? Okay, let, let me answer that second question first. Uh, if you ask me, I uh, you know I just love CBCT, so I I like to do CBCT in every case of mine. But because now I work for a corporate company where I move in different practices to work for the den, for the for the doctors, I don't have that um, the CBCT available as I would want it to be. So I don't do it frequently now. I, I, I depend more on my tactile sensation and more of my eyes, what I see on the radiograph and my tests. But if you ask me, I, I would say yes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk of, talks about this stuff that, uh, you know, there's radiation involved and, you know, it's a CBCT, it's a bigger image. Well, for, for endo, you just need to do a specific spot there, not the whole jaw. So you're saving the patient a lot of, uh, uh, you know, radiation. And then, of course, uh, you know, you're seeing better. So um, uh, uh, you can see more and more depth. You can slice it out down. You can see in different angles. And that helps. So uh, if you ask me, my answer is yes. Uh, that may not be the answer uh, you may get from other endodontists. I'm not sure. Uh, but yes, if you ask me, I love doing CV series. I love reading them. Um, and uh, so now let's, let's move to the, the first question was, the first question was? What? Which? Fair. Which yeah, case? so fair up, yeah. So uh, fair up is not very common. Uh, it's, it's about three to eight uh, percent chances after you do a root canal, or between two visits, uh, that the patient might have severe bouts of pain or even swelling. 
and that is uh, uh, that's just three to eight percent. So, can we predict who's going to have a flare up? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, studies have shown that patients who come with uh, pre-op severe pain may have chances of a flare up. Uh, patients who uh, uh, you know are females have more chances of flare ups. Um, uh, there, there are a few few points, and we can talk about that uh, in some other time. Uh, you know, pe people who have uh, allergies might might come up with flare ups. So these are all studies that come up, uh, and they, they're not very regularly found. Uh, but uh, one big giveaway is a patient with a, a large lesion and and a, a severe pain are patients who might have flare ups. Um, so uh, not all the time. I don't get flare ups all the time. I've treated patients with large lesions. Uh, in single visits and uh, they don't come back with pain. Uh, they do come back for follow-ups, of course, but they don't come back complaining with pain. So um, uh, it's not very common, but yes, it can happen. And before I let my patients go, I always tell them, hey, you know, Mr. X or Miss Ms. Y, uh, you know, I've done the root canal today. These are the medications I want you to start taking, uh, which is usually painkillers. And uh, uh, I want you to keep them uh, for a few days, uh, take them for a few days because you may have a flare up. I tell them always, you may have a flare up. Uh, like I said, communication with the patient is so important because now when they go home and after a day they, they feel the severe bout of pain, they won't go like, uh, you know, Dr. Siddiqui may have done something wrong in here. They go like Dr. Siddiqui told me that I may have this problem. Uh, so out of 10 patients, out of 100 patients that I see, only three or eight patients might uh, feel uh, uh, experience flare-ups, but those patients are ready for it. And, uh, and if, if they feel it, they, they don't call me screaming at me. They call me saying, hey, doc, you know, uh, I got it. You told me, you warned me, I got it. And I'm taking my medications. I feel much better. So that helps. Okay. Uh, have you come across cases um, with the herpes zoster um, and endocombination? Uh, no, I haven't come across that, but there is a, there is a relation, uh, correlation with that. Uh, you know, some, some studies have shown that, you know, the, the pulp has herpes virus also in it. So when they extract it, they study it, they've seen, you know, there's not just bacteria, but sometimes viral infection also in there. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, a herpes related kind of an inflammation in the mouth can mimic a toothache. So there you have to have a good history again, look at the, you know, look at the skin, look at the gums. Is there any pustules? You know, you need to look at all these things and, uh, and then understand that that tooth may not need a root canal, but maybe some, some kind of ointments or something, or just, just bed rest for a while and that helps. And we're just approaching, a, we've, we actually crossed the time and Sina is anxious to be waiting, I guess. Uh, one last question, how do you differentiate symptomatically and diagnostically between vertical tooth fracture and an endoperial lesion? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. I think, uh, uh, endo, uh, you know, the, the, the big giveaway would be a crack in the tooth. Uh, you know, I, like I said, if I feel that this tooth has a crack in there uh, and, and, and uh, you know, with perio, with perio uh, issues, you will have uh, uh, pocket depths of, uh, of uh, you know, like more than three millimeters, like five, six, seven, eight. Uh, but they will be more wider based. Uh, if you look for endo uh, 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 lesions, uh, they may have a pocket, but that's more localized, more isolated. So if you go and do your perio probing around the gum, so you'll feel normal, normal, normal. And all of a sudden it dips, just dips. And then again, normal, normal, normal. That's more of an endo lesion kind of a thing. If it's... Uh, if you go and it starts to go, it starts going deeper, 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 and then you come back, you know, so that's more of a perio lesion. And of course, if the tooth is dead, then that's an endoperio lesion. But, uh, but how do I demarcate that from a crack? Okay, uh, like I said, a crack will have uh, a more isolated kind of a lesion because of endo relation, and uh, you will have multiple. You may have not always, but you may have a multiple uh, sinus tracts on that side. Uh, you may have a J-shaped kind of a lesion on the radiograph. I, I'm saying may to all these things because do not uh, fall for these things that you read on the books and, and, and articles because they may present as J-shaped, but they may, they may no, not be any cracks, okay? Uh, my, my biggest giveaway is usually I look at through my microscope and I can see a crack or I stain the tooth and then look through my microscope then I can see the crack and then I go like, this is the cracked tooth. Um, Sometimes the crack is more deeper and I don't see it. Uh, so I tell the patient because the tooth is involved uh, irreversibly. Uh, I tell the patient, you know, I'm going to go in and I'm going to look for cracks uh, while I'm in there. And if I see a crack, I'm going to see the extent of the crack, how deep that goes. If it's going too deep, I'm going to come back out and I'm going to tell you it's not a savable tooth. 
If it's not going too deep, I will let you know still, like I said, communication, and we'll continue and finish the root canal treatment and you need an immediate crown. But I suspect there's a crack in the tooth and the tooth has a crown on, the, uh, on that one. And uh, that's another scenario where the patient might have a crown on the tooth and there's a crack under the crown and I cannot see it. So I, I, there I always uh, ask my, my general dentist to take the crown off for me so that I can see better because it's no use treating a tooth, spending so much time for, uh, on the patient, taking that money from the patient and then telling the patient in the end the tooth needs to come out.